lesson for today from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the second chapter beginning at verse 23 through the sixth verse of chapter 3. One Sabbath day he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then Jesus said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at the hardness of their hearts and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him on how to destroy him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and our minds that we may hear a joy your word for us this day. And as we hear it, let it plant seed that will grow and bear fruit in our hearts, in our lives, in this church and beyond, now and forevermore. Amen. Some years ago, a good friend of mine, Kelly Blackman, shared this story with me. He was a sergeant, a prison guard at the prison in Lillington, North Carolina. That is a medium security unit with all the barbed wire and you've got to show IDs, get in and out, all the kind of thing. Well, one day he and his wife were at Walmart shopping. She'd gone off over to the food area and he was in the hardware looking for something and it was on the bottom shelf. And Kelly, being a big man over six foot tall, had to get down on the floor to be able to see it. So he's down there in that position and he hears a voice behind him that he immediately recognizes that says, Hello, Sergeant Blackman. He recognized the boys as a recently released inmate from the prison who had a record of violence. Kelly said, I didn't have any weapons on me. He forgot my pocket knife. But I immediately stood and went into a defensive stance thinking that this man was about to attack him. But instead, the inmate reached out his hand to shake hands with him. And as he took Sergeant Blackman's big hands in his, he said, Sergeant, I wanted to thank you. You were one of the few people in that prison that treated me like I was a human being. And turned and walked away. Grace changes everything. I know it sounds strange in the world in which we live. When we look around us and see so much vile stuff, so much evil, hatefulness, meanness, violence, anger, destruction. But grace really does change things. Consider this text with me today. Jesus has two encounters with the Pharisees here on the Sabbath day. The first one, they're going through the grain fields and they're hungry and they pick some grain to eat. No, it is not lawful to pick grain according to Jewish law because guess what? That's work and you can't work on Sabbath. So when they challenged Jesus on this, what did he do? He went back to their own story and said, well, don't you remember how David went into the temple and ate the bread of the presence? In some translations, they'll say the shoe bread. That's the bread for the priest. Consecrated, and other people can't touch it, only the priest. But David ate of that loaf, and he gave some to his companions. Well, they didn't have an answer to that. How did you refute real history? Can't. Well, he went on to the synagogue, and they were watching him, and there was a man there with a withered hand. And so they were waiting to see, would he cure him on the Sabbath or not? Because if you cure on the Sabbath, guess what? Work. Well, unlawful. And so Jesus said to them, knowing what they were thinking, because he knew Jesus could read hearts and minds, he said, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do wrong? Is it lawful to help or to hurt? Which one is better? But there was no answer. And so Jesus said to the man, come here. And the man came to him and he said, Now stretch out your hand. This man had a drawn up, gnarled up hand. He began to move and as he stretched it out, it suddenly was healed and he could use that hand again. And the Pharisees saw it and what did they do? They went out and plotted to destroy him. 
But the people who saw this began to get a different understanding of the nature of grace. That's what Jesus was trying to get across. That His presence here was about grace. The Sabbath day is not about a bunch of rules and regulations. It's about worship and rest and renewal and fellowship. It's about celebrating the gift that God has given us. Sabbath is a gift. God rested and it was good and so He gave it to us as a gift. The day of Sabbath. Oh no. That's the problem with legalism. Legalism is a box. But the love of God in Jesus Christ shattered it. And gave us a whole new understanding of grace and how it changes things. Consider with me this morning please how grace changes things. First of all, it changes how we see God. We are to look at God as a loving Father, not a prison warden. Not someone who is interested in keeping all the rules and banging us over the head if we break the rules. But instead, a loving Father who reaches out to love us. Yes, it's true that loving fathers sometimes have to speak words of rebuke. That doesn't mean they don't love us. They still take us in their arms and speak wonderful words of love to remind us that it's not about the rules, it's about the relationship. When I turned 16, got my license, started to date, my very first date, my father said to me, Now son, you know what my rules are? I said, yes sir, I have five older sisters and an old brother. They were written in stone in our home. I said, yes sir. He said, well do me a favor. Don't keep the rules because they're my rules. Keep them because you love me. That's psychology. I could break a rule, rule just a rule. But I don't want to break my dad's heart. There's a difference in the nature of how grace makes a loving relationship. Unfortunately, too many people have this wrong-headed idea about what God's like. Dr. Vince Vitale, who's a professor of religion at Oxford University, tells a story that once he asked a student who seemed to be depressed, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, do you think God loves you? And he said, no, God can't love me. Why can't he? I've done too many wrong things. And Vince said, I sat down and explained to him that God is a loving father. He's not concerned about the rules. He wants to love you out of that. He'll forgive you. He'll redeem you. He'll put all that stuff gone. It won't be there anymore. Please come to understand. He's a loving father. He's not like that. We got to help the world again see what God is like. The God of grace and glory. God of love and goodness. This is a wonderful story about a Sunday school teacher that asked the kids to draw a picture of something that meant something to them about the Lord. And one little girl was drawing a picture, and the teacher was looking at all of them, and she said, What are you drawing? She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. She said, Well, honey, nobody knows what God looks like. She said, I know, but they will when I get finished. <laughs> You and I are supposed to be the artists drawing that picture that the world can see through us and the grace in us, the gracefulness of God that wants to reach out to people who are hurting in our world. I think the reason there's so much anger and vitriol in our world is people don't know the love of God. Because once you know the love of God, how can you still be that way? Grace changes things and it changes hearts, it changes minds, it changes lives. It changes how we see God. It changes how we see our neighbor. It has to. Because when grace enters us, we look at people differently. Brothers and sisters. Yes, we may speak against bad things. But we love. We see our neighbors as people who are children of God like us. We want to love each other. Even when it's hard to do, we're still going to do it because grace has changed us. And we're not going to respond. Jesus said, you don't return evil for evil. Those who take up a sword are going to die by it. A kind word turns away wrath. You know all those things. Well, what he's saying is, act with grace. Even when it's so very hard to do. Several years ago, there was a story that made the news in Raleigh. There, off of Newburn Avenue, they had bought an old house, one of these big old houses, and renovated it. And they were turning it into a, a hospice house for men who had HIV AIDS. The community was in an uproar. People were angry. They threatened to bomb the house, to burn it down. Well, 
They won in court, the, the people that were putting the house there, the hospice place, they won their case in court and they began to bring patients in who were dying. They sent out a notice and said, before you condemn us, why don't you just come and, and see who these people are? Well, there was a lady that lived there near that house and so something touched her and she went down to, to see for herself. Not what people were saying, not what she read in the paper, she wanted to see. And she met four young men there who were dying in their 20s. And all they really wanted was somebody to sit next to them and talk. Read the Bible to them. Pray with them. Listen to them. Bring them a cookie if they could eat. And she realized it wasn't at all what she thought. And you know, she started going there more often and visiting and becoming a volunteer and spending time with these young men that were dying. Grace got hold of her and she was a different person. It was a problem, however. When she went to her church on Sunday, nobody would sit in the pew with her anymore. She wasn't allowed in people's homes anymore. See, grace doesn't change everybody. It will if they'll let it. And that's why it's so important for you and I to be out there at seeds of grace so that we can help people see things differently the way God sees it. Marvelous true story. When, when President Washington was in office, the <clears throat> Revolutionary War had ended now, and there were numbers of requests for clemency for people. Well, a, a minister named Peter Miller traveled 70 miles to meet with Mr. Washington to plead for the life of Michael Whitman. Now, what made this extraordinary was that Michael Whitman lived in the community where Peter was a pastor, and he was a mortal enemy. He made Peter's life miserable. Did everything he could to hurt him. And he pled for his life, and the president said, you know, I just don't know if I can spare the life of your friend. He said, my friend, Mr. President, you don't understand. He's my mortal enemy. He's done everything he can to hurt me. And Washington said, you travel 70 miles to plead for the life of an enemy? I've never seen such an act of grace. Set him free. I will not execute him. See, he was a traitor, Michael Whitman. He was a Tory. He was guilty of treason. But an act of grace... How we see our neighbors. Peter saw him differently. Not an enemy. But a child of God that needed grace. When we can do that. We can heal a lot of wounds. We can change a lot of life. Well we can help. We can be agents of change. God does the change. But we can be a part of it. Changes how we see God. Grace changes how we see our neighbor. It also changes how we see life. We live differently. Yes. We still can talk about the things that are wrong or bad in our world. But we love folks who fail, who say the bad things or do the wrong thing. We love them anyway because that's the nature of grace. We want to see them redeemed, not doing those things. Can't do that unless you and I are willing to be a part of it. G.K. Chesterton, the great writer and philosopher, once asked the question, what is wrong with this world? And here's how he answered it. I am. He had to change first. We have to change our thinking first if we want the world to change. As Francis of Assisi wrote it, let there be peace on earth, but let it begin with me. We're the beginning agent. It has to start with us. And when we let that grace enfold us, it heals a myriad of things. In 1950, there was a missionary from Japan who spoke at a church in Ohio. There was a woman there whose son was killed in the Pacific, uh, fighting the Japanese. And she had this terrible bitterness and anger toward the Japanese people. Well, this missionary ran an orphanage there. And he asked the people there to pray. Well, afterwards, this woman came up to him and she said, They killed my son, and you want me to pray for them? And he said to her very softly, Ma'am, if you pray for them, you won't be able to hate them. And so she started, hard as it was, <laughs> with tears in her eyes and still with anger, beginning to pray every day, and day by day by day, the anger diminished. And she found herself one day praying for those children and loving them because grace got hold of her heart. Grace changes things. How we see God, how we see our neighbor, how we see life. People of grace are the ones who really change the world. They're the only ones that can. When you and I come to this table, we see the most striking example of grace there ever has been. Grace is fully revealed in broken bread and a cup of wine. 
Because here God poured out His grace upon us. This is my body broken for you, my blood shed for you, and for many. You can't leave this table the same. Because here at this table, you will be filled with grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.